invitation. I'm uh, giving this lecture from the tip of Africa, where we've all been locked away from the rest of the world due to COVID, which is obviously a big problem here in South Africa. So I would like to tell you a little bit about a, a different problem that we have, and that is of uh, tracheal stenosis and the management of uh, tracheal stenosis. And actually, the, the reason we started developing this new balloon is, as I'm sure is similar in the rest of the world, um, when a patient comes in with a narrow airway, like you can see in this endoscopic view at the bottom, um, it's usually the most senior uh, consultant that is required um, to manage these patients. So just uh, my disclosures, I am a, a consultant for Diza uh, Medinotech, who developed the uh, traculator balloon, and I'm also one of the patent uh, holders and have a royalty agreement with them. And then the technique, technique that will be discussed for continuous ventilation um, has been further developed by Professor Ross Hoffmeyer from the Department of Anesthesia. And we work very closely together. So if we just see why is tracheal stenosis such a, 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 challenge, a challenging uh, disease, um, we know that it's a, a very high risk uh, shared airway procedure um, between the ENT, the anesthetist, the cardiothoracic surgeons, and we're competing for goals between the surgeon and the anesthetist. It really is a debilitating disease, and uh, specifically now post-COVID, with all these patients being ventilated for so many months, we're seeing uh, a massive increase in patients present presenting with airway stenosis, and really very difficult airway stenosis from the area of the glottis to further down in the trachea, and we often find patients have multiple level stenosis at the level of the glottic glottis, infraglottis, and often also just above the carina. So really, really difficult. We know that 90% of these stenosis are iatrogenic, um, and often these patients sit with uh, long-term tracheostomies. And repetitive procedures are required uh, to, to manage these patients. So these patients also have uh, underlying respiratory disease, which makes ventilation really difficult. Um, they've got poor physiological reserves. So we know that you only have a couple of seconds to, to um, uh, make sure that you maintain the airway or, or get an adequate airway. They're difficult to ventilate and oxygenate uh, while you've got such a small stenosis. And switching between the traditional suspension laryngoscopy that ENT surgeons are familiar with, with bronchoscopy, um, can be quite time consuming. And just that 30 seconds often um, makes a patient desaturate. Then all the traditional um, dilators that are available um, are all occlusive in nature. You can see this occlusive balloon. So we know that if you've got a tight stenosis and you manage to dilate it for those couple of seconds, um, the anesthetist is completely uh, unable to ventilate. So if you look at our traditional methods, um, you know, when I started back in 2003 and I was called for, for all of these patients up to um, a couple of years ago, we dilated these patients with solid bougies and uh, that the, the esophageal uh, bougies um, that the cardiothoracic surgeons use, also with rigid bronchoscopes. And we know how traumatic this is, but often that's the only way if you have a patient who's in distress with a very small narrow airway, um, you often um, were forced to um, try and get a rigid bronchoscope through that area. So the balloons that have been available have been um, all solid balloons um, with the inability to ventilate these patients. So then we, uh, if you're able to dilate that stenosis, then we have the question is, um, can they undergo a primary resection or um, do we do stenting um, after kind of laser treatment? So the concept of the non-occlusive balloon developed because what I found was the balloons that were um, available were all too short to fit through a, a rigid uh, bronchoscope. So you can use a esophageal balloon, but it's not really made for, for tracheal uh, stenosis. So we wanted a balloon that had additional length to allow us to use through the rigid bronchoscope. Um, we wanted to be able to kind of uh, jet ventilate uh, if necessary. Um, to and reduce that risk of barotrauma. 
um, and potentially allow oxygenation and ventilation of that balloon. And you can see the design at the bottom here. We've got um, eight balloons or seven or eight balloons that's uh, concentrically um, designed um, and you can see we ventilate this patient through the what we call the interballoon space so uh, between each in individual balloon but through the center lumen uh, we have got the ability to um, jet ventilate or um, the put a guide wire uh, or connect with oxygen or even a, a diode laser. So we started off with just with, and this was the um, work of Professor Ross Hofmeyer. We started working on uh, mannequins and uh, designing just the adequate length for the, for the balloon. Um, uh, we had to develop a, a ventilator adapter. Um, and you'll see in the um, following videos how easy these patients are now managed by even our most junior registrar. In, in fact, most of our um, emergency airways that come in um, may even be managed by the um, anaesthetist before the ENT surgeon gets there. So we looked at the assessment of the use through the standard endotracheal tube, through a tracheostomy tube and through the rigid bronchoscope, um, and then developed the technique using a supraglottic airway or the, what we call the LMA laryngeal mask airway. So we started off with doing an ovine study with eight adult sheep uh, with healthy tracheas. They were all going undergoing a general anesthetic for some other cardiac uh, study um, and then uh, looked at continuously recording the pulse oximetry, capnography and the ventilation pressures and, and flow. I won't spend too much time on this because we want to get through to the, uh, to the actual surgical videos, but what uh, this demonstrates is essentially that uh, with a balloon, um, with no balloon in the trachea, with a balloon deflated in the trachea, and the balloon uh, uh, inflated or deflated in the trachea, the, the ventilated, uh, ventilation parameters were essentially all the same. The airflow was the same, um, and we're able to ventilate these patients and oxygenate them all um, in the similar fashion. This also shows just the tidal volumes and the peak airway, airway pressures with the uh, ET tube only, and then with the inflated and a deflated balloon, showing that um, uh, you have uh, the same tidal volume whether the balloon is inflated or not. So we then, uh, from the animal study, went on to a prospective uh, human study. And the aims were to, to purely see, not even to see whether we could uh, delay the stenosis adequately, but rather to see whether we could success, successfully ventilate and oxygenate uh, during the airway dilation. Um, and you can see in this picture that the, the interballoon space is the, the area where the airflow is coming through from a supraglottic airway. So we were um, uh, looking at successfully dilating the airway stenosis to avoid uh, emergency tracheostomy and just to allow for time for de definitive management. We know that if these patients come in very stridulous in an airway crisis, they often um, get an emergency tracheostomy, which makes subsequent treatment very difficult because you might have a very uh, a small stenosis or a short stenosis of two millimeters, and then someone does a tracheostomy two centimeters below that. So your resection might have been a centimeter of the trachea, it might end up being four centimeters, which becomes uh, more tricky. So just uh, one slide on the, on the prospective uh, interventional study. We just, and this was now about four years ago already, where we looked at 20 dilation procedures in, in adult patients only with tracheal stenosis. Um, and we proved that we could ventilate them easily and oxygenate, oxygenate them all in, in, in all 20 patients. The oxygen concentration remained above 97% 97 in 19 uh, cases. And the, the one case who had, I think, a saturation of 93% had a pre-existing condition, and that was the pre-op uh, uh, oxygen levels. So we also found that the cotton mire grading improved significantly as you can see on the on this graph here with the tracheal uh, diameter. So this was kind of a subsequent um, um, added benefit as you want for the study because we wanted to see whether we could oxygenate and ventilate. But we also saw that we successfully managed to um, uh, dilate the stenosis in these patients. 
So it was really interesting. We had three patients with multi-level stenosis due to tuberculosis and IgG4 sclerosing disease. And these were very difficult to manage. The, the one patient with IgG4 sclerosing disease had multiple stenotic uh, segments uh, and in fact had a laryngectomy for complete uh, glottic stenosis before the diagnosis was essentially made. She then went on to um, stenose the rest of her trachea and also both main bronchi um, to such an extent that they uh, considered ECMO for her. That was the only way to, to actually um, put her to sleep and she would have required a double lung transplant. Uh, but we managed to, with the air a balloon um, um, uh, salvage that case and managed to successfully dilate even the uh, distal main bronchi. So after this um, uh, study, we now looked at uh, more recently a, re a retrospective study just over the last uh, uh, two years, just pre-COVID 2017 to 2019 at our main academic hospital, Khrudiski Hospital. And we looked at the, those patients who underwent the non-occlusive balloon dilatation. And we looked at the demographics, the, the kind of pathology they had, the prevent, how many of them prevent, could we prevent a tracheostomy and allow for a definitive plan. Um, so we only had 18 patients at that time with a mean age of 39, and 67% uh, of them had intubation-related uh, injury, so for, for post-long-term ventilation. So the pathology was um, uh, just about 40% subglottic stenosis, then lower down another 39% tracheal stenosis. Supraglottic airway was 11%. And this is usually related to trauma or, um, as I said, tuberculosis or IgG4 sclerosing disease. And 11% of them had really uh, difficult airway stenosis. So we could uh, do a single dilation in 28% um, and, and two more dilations in 72% in, uh, had multiple and 28 single uh, dilations. And as a general rule, we'll dilate someone twice before we decide that they need more definitive uh, treatment management. Uh, eight of those patients, 44% did not require a tracheostomy. Unfortunately, the rest all had a tracheostomy performed at a, at a distant hospital before they um, arrived with us. And then three out of those 10 uh, underwent decanylation following the first dilation but allowed us uh, to do a definitive plan for the rest of those patients. And two of those patients with tracheal stenosis had elations um, and the tracheostomy is uh, long-term prevented. And um, a, a few of them then went on to further tracheal resection. So the conclusion here was that the use of a non-occlusive uh, balloon allowed for successful ventilation oxygenation. We could successfully dilate it. And uh, in our long-term uh, studies that we'll um, present soon, we now see that uh, a large percentage of patients, uh, we can uh, avoid tracheostomy and also actually avoid resection. We have um, those patients that failed dilation twice, we sent uh, for, for uh, resections. And often what we have found is that um, as soon as they get onto the cardiothoracic list and they get a bronchoscopy, they've been found that the uh, airway has in fact not narrowed up and uh, they got away with a third uh, dilation instead of a tracheal uh, resection. So if we look at our old fashioned way that we did rigid bronchoscopy, um, you can evaluate the subglottic stenosis and you can see we, this is where we use a supraglottic airway even for uh, the most severe stenosis where you have a one or two millimeter airway. We put a little guide wire um, over this, uh, through the stenosis, and then we feed the tracheal balloon. And you can see the uh, with the flexible bronchoscope, we can actually go into oh, the interballoon space. Um, here you can see, you can actually assess that uh, the, uh, we are past the, the tracheal stenosis. So here you can appreciate the ventilation through the non-occlusive balloon. The center lumen here you could use for, as I said, a, um, the guide wire or a diode laser 
or even for the jet ventilation. So let's just look at the different techniques that we used, uh, suspension, laryngoscopy. This I really only use for those patients that have a tracheostomy because, um, and you have different options. You can let them breathe spontaneously, put oxygen cannula down, jet ventilate, or put an ET tube down intermittently. Um, there are definite uh, pros to this, that you've got a lot of space for your instruments. You've got a great view. Um, and ENTs are very familiar with using this technique. The cons are its ventilation is obviously more difficult. And you can see the balloon can hit the uh, end of the uh, laryngoscope. And this could potentially damage the balloon. So here we'll demonstrate the suspension laryngoscopy for, um, for a patient who has a tracheostomy. This is my anesthetist, uh, Professor Hofmeyer. And you can see that this patient has a complete tracheostomy stenosis. So the problem here is that these patients don't have uh, any voice. So they might have a, a tracheostomy, but um, they're unable to speak. So here we did a laser procedure. Then we used the balloon in this uh, instant. And this patient, we stented afterwards and uh, considered for uh, eventual um, tracheal resection. But the benefit is here that um, at least you can uh, establish an airway. You can beautifully see the interballoon space here once again. Um, and you can go and evaluate and see whether you've actually gone past the, um, the stenotic segment. You deflate the balloon, and you often see if you have to inflate the balloon in the area of the vocal cords, you might find that there's a little notching in the vocal cords, and this settles. You can see the indentations, and this completely settles uh, um, afterwards. So if we look at the supraglottic airway, and this is now the standard way that we uh, manage these patients, all of these patients get a, a, a supraglottic airway. Um, and here you can see um, Ross Hoffmeyer inserting uh, um, the guide wire in the flexible bronchoscope. And you can see the monitor at the, at the background. This is a very narrow stenosis, but the patient's uh, ventilating and oxygenating at 100%. This really buys you a lot of time that the most junior person in your department, in fact, can, can do um, the stenosis. You then feed the uh, balloon over the guide wire. And you require, uh, obviously, with a supraglottic airway, um, a special little adapter that um, that comes with the balloon. But here we use a bronchial adapter that you can find on the bronch bronchial set. Um, and this allows for you to ventilate and put two um, instruments in. So your flexible bronchoscope and then also your, your balloon. Um, so we'll just see the, the balloon go in and um, going through the, um, the LMA. So you can also use a, a rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, you have to use a tracheoscope and not a bronchoscope. Here you can see the bronchoscope being de demonstrated with the um, little spaces in the distal area of the bronchoscope, which obviously makes ventilation difficult. So it's better to close these openings and use a, 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 um, a tracheoscope. Then just lastly, I just want to show you, um, this is once again myself and uh, our anesthetist, and here we're doing a awake tracheal dilation, and I believe in the, in the UK, um, this is now routinely done, and a paper uh, will be um, published soon on awake dilatations in the outpatient setting. And here you can see uh, the balloon is going up to a six bar. And, and so, so the maximum is, is 10 bar. Yeah, we've inflated it at, a, a, at a, a 6 bar. But you can see the oxygenation at 100%. And you can see the balloon is inflated. Um, and uh, uh, the only discomfort was the insertion of the balloon by the anesthetist, uh, fury turbid in the nasopharynx. So this needs a little bit of local anesthetic. But you don't really feel the balloon going through the, the vocal cords or uh, the trachea at all. So yeah, you can see it's inflating the balloon. Um, and you can see at the, at the back, the pulse rate going up a little bit but oxygenating, uh, oxygenation uh, remaining at 100%. And you can see the balloon in, once again in the background. 
so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Professor Ross Hofmeyer, who's uh, kind of uh, developed this technique and um, um, doing his PhD on that. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much.